and welcome back. Today, we're going to tackle Anthony Riley and his new theory of dumb. What's more, we're going to use cheese. Quick thanks to my amazing patrons. With massive thanks to all my patrons, including new patrons, Chris Holmes, Crafty Keeler, Nal Pinion, William Schofield, Nicola Redmond, AZ Atheist, Grumpy Old Man, Hugh Jars, Larry XK, Yuha Escalinen, Purple Rhymes with Orange and Tim Nicholas, and my latest patrons, Roy C and Patricia Desangeles. Thank you all so very much. Well, let's crack on then. We've got a lot to get through. Mr. Riley, roll VT. This video is going to question whether or not there could be a third interpretation for the Michelson Morley experiment that overrides both the previous ones. It's also going to question your sanity. By the way, we can all agree that the Michelson Morley experiment is complicated because the effects of it, when you try and interpret it, becomes very convoluted. And I'm going to suggest that either interpretation could actually be wrong. Well, I guess that's true, Tony. But I would hazard a guess that your interpretation will be even wronger. -er. So is there a third interpretation? I'm going to suggest that there is a third interpretation for the Michelson Morley experiment. One that is far more intuitive, very simple to understand, and indeed very straightforward. For Dunning-Kruger-powered idiots who haven't got the faintest idea what they're talking about. He references the Sagnac experiment and he shows that the red ball and the blue ball go around the apparatus, reconverge, and then this is the effect known as Sagnac. Anthony, perhaps you better stick to salt and eggs. He then does it on a spinning disc and he shows that for whatever reason there appears to be a delay um, with one of the balls going with the rotation compared to one of the balls going against the rotation. For whatever reason. You're obviously lost already. The interpretation from whichever side of the camp that you're on at least accepts that what Malcolm Bowden shows on screen does actually happen. Well, I'm glad that you accept that it happens, but there is no interpretation. It's obvious. So let's forget for the moment the interpretations from both sides and let's look at what we actually see. I don't think you do actually see what's happening. We'll play Bowden's clip again where he's showing the, the convenient animation of the red ball and the blue ball taking different lengths of time to travel the same path. The whole point is, Tony, they take different lengths of time because the path of one has been extended. Well... Let's look at what we see and say what we see. OK, I see DFOTY, who's about to embarrass himself yet again. We see the one ball is faster than the other ball. No, the balls, the light, is travelling at exactly the same speed in both directions. So the blue ball seems to get home before the red ball, because... It has travelled a shorter path. It's, it's travelling with respect to the moving frame of reference. Whereas the red ball gets home slower than the blue ball because it's travelling, it's, it's catching it up, it's trying to catch up the path. It's not getting there slower, Tony. It's getting there later. It's like having two cars racing, but the finish line for one keeps moving that little bit further away, so it arrives later. But both cars were going the same speed. Well, what are we actually seeing? We're seeing something that could be called red shift and blue shift. No, we're not. So let's not look at the path or the time duration. Let's consider the colours that have been used by Bowden. Not consider the path and the time duration. That's the whole bloody point of the experiment. And as to what colours he chose, he might have chosen pink and orange. It doesn't matter. It's a diagrammatic illustration of what's happening probably innocently and accidentally you know coincidentally but nonetheless he does use colors and that gave me an idea let's consider the effects of doppler for a moment oh yes let's we see that on a motorcycle traveling down the road at a constant uh, velocity and a constant tone it is perceived by a bystander to be completely different so let's, let's have a listen to this clip of the motorcycle whilst it's uh, travelling at a constant like speed and therefore a constant tone. And then we'll consider the effect from the observer. I can't wait to see this, Tony, and the conclusions that you draw. Now, 
I think both sides could probably agree that... That your theory is going to be a pile of sh- The motorcycle was travelling at a constant speed with a constant pitch, yet the observer saw it as rising as it approached, and as it passes, it appears to drop, and as it's going away, it appears to lower. We can all agree with that Doppler, right? Yes, Doppler. As the bike approaches, the sound waves are in effect bunched up, raising the pitch. And as it's gone past you, the sound waves are spread out, lowering the pitch. Well, what if Doppler affects light? Wow. Tony, it does. Let's have another look at the Michelson Morley experiment from Bowden. And let's consider whether or not we're actually seeing Doppler of light. Okay, I considered it, and we're not. And it's going through the prism, and that's effectively slowing it down. Any effect the prism is having on the light affects all the light. Some of it is going all the way through, some of it is going half the way through, and reflecting back. The same amount of prism. Effectively, that would be the observer, and the light passing past the observer. Like the motorcycle passes past the, uh, the cameraman. Really? So now you're saying the observer changed the sound of that motorbike by the fact it went past them? Regardless of the interpretation, if you accept that one ball gets there faster than the other ball... And we don't. It just gets there sooner. Then you have to accept that the blue ball or the red ball is faster or slower than the other ball. And if I drop these two boxes and they arrived at the table in different times then you have to accept that one box fell faster than the other. Or perhaps that second box had further to fall. Now we know that it's caused by the rotating platform, but it doesn't change the fact that there is a change in speed. Tony, I presume you can tie your own shoelaces, so I can't understand how you can't see that if the platform's rotating, the path one beam of light has to take is longer, because the path is changing. It's not difficult. I'm going to call that red shift and blue shift. And I'm going to call it idiocy and stupidity. Rather than anything to do with whether or not the ether exists. Which then poses the question, well... Where the hell are Anthony's carers? If light could Doppler, do we see any evidence of Doppler with light in our real world? Yes, we do. Ask an astronomer. And we do. Let's have a little look. This is um, Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole's latest video. He does a lot of sunset videos. And we can tell just by looking at the video that the characteristics of the light is kind of orangey, warm, soft. People watch sunsets because they're phenomenally beautiful, right? Right. And that's why they watch me as well, Tony. But the three key words that I would suggest is what we're seeing is soft, warm, orange. And then in brackets, redshift. Whereas in contrast, this is a video from somebody that's not in the topic. It's just a random sunrise video. And we can see that the, the light appears to be more blue. I'm going to say it's cooling or sharper different and that difference i'm going to describe as blue shift you really have no idea what you're talking about do you so whilst we're watching this video of sunrise if the earth is approaching us from the distance the way the flat earth model suggests it might be then you would expect red shift and blue shift because as the sun is approaching us from a distance, it should be blue shift. Two things, Tony. If the sun was whizzing towards us over a flat earth, as the model suggests, then why doesn't its angular size change? And secondly, why don't cars racing towards us all appear blue and those racing away all appear red? And as the sun is dis disappearing into the distance, like a train going down the train tracks, that would be redshift. And we do see that in the real world. We do see a blue tinge to sunrise, and we do see a red tinge or an orange tinge to sunset. Try it yourself.
go and observe any sunrise, you'll see that it's not similar to a sunset. One's cold, one's warm. One's blue shift, one's red shift. Are you sure about that, Tony? Can you tell which of these are sunrises and which are sunsets just by looking? I certainly wouldn't bet my life on getting it right. And we do see that. And that would be Doppler on light. And the sunrise and sunset would be the absolute proof that we all see daily without any expensive equipment that would be consistent with the assertion that we might be seeing Doppler shift. Tony, the Doppler shift is a real thing. If I'm talking to you as I walk towards you, and carry on talking as I walk past, though, you won't hear a change in the tone of my voice. You wouldn't have seen me appearing slightly blue as I walked towards you and slightly red as I walked away. But the light is Dopplered. The problem is scale. The change is so slight you won't measure it. The ball earth explanation for the sunset, as you can see on screen right now, is apparently caused by the angle and scatter. Well, the angle for sunrise and the angle for sunset would be the same if you got the right angle. So you should see a warming sunrise as well as a warming sunset, but we don't. We see a cooling sunrise and a warming sunset. <coughs> so the heliocentric working model doesn't even account for this because it can't account for the blue shift in the morning. It can account for the red shift at sunset, but what's the explanation for in the morning? Well, it's nothing to do with Doppler shift. So I think finally, Tony, we ought to talk about that and try and explain it to you. And we'll do a Doppler shift experiment using cheese. OK, here's the electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from gamma rays through X-rays, UV, visible, and so on, all the way down to long radio waves. As you can see, the visible spectrum is only a part of it. Now, when you use spectroscopy, against the light source, such as the sun, something interesting happens. You get absorption lines, like these. These absorption lines, or Fraunhofer lines, are like a chemical fingerprint. Each element produces its own pattern of lines. Now, if you take a spectrograph of an object that's moving away from you at great speed, then you get redshift where all the absorption lines are moved over slightly. It doesn't mean that everything has gone totally red, just that they've shifted slightly towards the red end. Now the absorption lines for the sun do not shift towards the red or towards the blue, depending on the time of day you look at the spectrum. However, let's compare the absorption lines from the sun with the absorption lines from a supercluster of galaxies called BAS11. Now, this supercluster of galaxies are a long way away from us, around a billion light years, and moving further away all the time. Comparing the spectrographs, you can see that the absorption lines have redshifted. However, to do that, that cluster is travelling away from us at 0.07 times the speed of light. That's over 13,000 miles per second. So there you go, Tony. You are not going to visibly see the sun change, sunset and sunrise due to Doppler. But how about an experiment to try and prove it? I need something faster than my office. Beam me up. Much better. So, in order to test this, Tony, I'm going to move one object very quickly towards you and one object very quickly away from you, and we'll see what happens. Those objects are two cubes of cheddar cheese. Okay. Three, two, one, go. And what will happen, Tony? Nothing at all. Oh, um, it would appear that we've shifted into Red Leicester and Blue Stilton. 
Hold on a minute. Oh, hello, is that Mr. DeGrasse Tyson? Yeah, yeah, it's Mr. Sensible. Um, I was just doing an experiment to disabuse Anthony Riley that um, sunsets and sunrises, the colours, are caused by Doppler shift. Unfortunately, um, my experiment went a bit awry and now I have Doppler shifted cheese. Um, yeah, I'm concerned that this will back up the flat earthers. What can I do? Oh, I like that. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Appreciate it. Um, Neil's come up with a solution to this. Mm. Redshift tastes good. Mm. Definitely prefer blue shift Stilton. Ballers will understand this video. So ballers don't bother replying, because you're all gonna, you're all stupid. You all deny evidence contrary to your opinion always, and resort to ad hominem attack always. Really, Tony? What was it you just said? Because you're all gonna, you're all stupid. But it doesn't change the fact that calling me an idiot or a retard or whatever. Oh, I don't think you really want to go there again, Tony. Not after your recent videos, accusing half a dozen people, including myself of being spastics. Anyway, you are so, so wrong on this whole redshift, blue shift thing that it's ridiculous. And everybody, everybody can see it. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Until next time, take care and stay sensible. Shut up and sit down.